So today, it's a bit of a, a mixed lecture. I'm going to finish the tools uh, section that got started about a week ago. I'm going to talk about spectrophotometer and spectroscopy. And then uh, at about 1040, Frank is Frank Schwang, who you met last week, is going to come back. <clears throat> and he's going to talk to you about general CBST science. So he's going to give you an overview of all the different projects. Some of them will be projects that you'll get a chance to see firsthand on this Wednesday when you guys go for a field trip over to Oak Park. Okay? But I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of my section. <clears throat> so, where are we? We've talked about light sources. We've talked about light matter, light tissue interaction. You've gotten a whirlwind tour of biology and molecular biology. And you've learned about tools. We did that last week, and today we're going to finish tools. Okay? And really in tools, we include the interpretation, but you'll be talking about interpretation as we continue in the course. When we discussed the tools last week, we talked about the laser. And the big thing about the laser was that it's powerful, controllable, it can manipulate, alter, and probe biological samples. We talked about fiber optics. And if you guys remember, the fiber optics allows you to control where you bring the light. You can sneak it into different parts of the body. We talked about the microscope and its capabilities to see things alive at a very small scale. Okay, that was the big thing. And what we're trying to do is get lower and lower in resolution. I mean, sorry, higher higher resolution so we can see smaller and smaller things still alive. We talked about the eye. You guys got to see your blind spot. Okay, hopefully you guys only have one on each eye, and didn't have extra ones caused by lasers. We talked about the CCD and how we transmit information in series of zeros and ones. And we talked about how the CCD can only see amount of light. So if you want to get color information, you have to put filters in front of the CCDs. And a common way to do it is to find out how much red, how much green, and how much blue light is there, and then combine that information together to give us one of the rich and complex colors that we enjoy all the time, okay? So our eyes can see 12 million and, and, and some change in colors. We can sense these different colors and our computer screens can pretty much represent those colors by combinations of red, green, and blue. Now we're gonna talk about the spectrophotometer, which can give you specific energy and intensity information. So, the spectrophotometer, when you're doing spectroscopy, you use a spectrophotometer to get you the information. Spectroscopy is kind of the art or science of what you're doing. And spectroscopy is really a way to analyze a sample based on how it interacts with energy. Okay? In our case, we have it interact with light. We tell, figure out something about that interaction, and that gives us a spectrum that tells us something about the wavelength of light we used, and how much of it was absorbed, reflected, diffracted, refracted. It could be all kinds of different things. Okay? But it's usually looking at wavelength versus some kind of intensity. Now, why do we use spectroscopy? We use it to study things that are either too far away or can't be easily or otherwise interrogated. So a really great example of that is stars. We want to find out what gas is around that star, what temperature that star is. How are we going to do that? We can't send a probe out there. Okay? The closest star is our sun, and it's pretty far away. And the next closest star is farther away than we could travel in our lifetimes unless we figure out a way to go with the speed of light. Okay? So we can figure out things about stars, galaxies, and comets. And also we can find out things about our body. You can find out things about what's happening in the eye, what's working, not working, that might be too hard to just interrogate the person on. You can find out things about the brain and the cells in the brain or the cells in the body by interrogating them with light. Okay? What's one thing we might be able to do by interrogating cells with light? Something we might be able to tell about them. Any thoughts? Yes? Composition, what, uh, what all this happens? What elements might be there? Certain uh, for the, the types of elements or the ratios, for example, of RNA and DNA, the amounts, relative amounts. Anything else? Higher order that you could figure out by interrogating a solid light? We really haven't talked about this yet, but you can figure out by interrogating a cell with light with certain types of spectroscopy, like Raman spectroscopy, 
whether it's cancerous or non-cancerous. Raman. R-A-M-A-N. You'll be hearing more about this later today, too. We can figure out <coughs> uh, metabolic activity. We can look for certain metabolites in a cell. We can look at different, distinguish between different types of stem cells. And because they all have six, uh, different optical signatures, different spectra when interrogative of life. Okay. Now, <coughs> spectroscopy can be used to identify what's in a sample, and that ends up being called qualitative. But it can also help you figure out how much of something is in a sample, and that's quantitative. Okay, do you guys remember me mentioning Beer's Law? <coughs> okay. Beer's Law, bless you. Beer's Law had a very straightforward formula that basically looked at how long is the path that you're sending the light through, what's the specific absorption of that material that's inside your path, and what's the concentration of that material. And that would equal the absorbance. So you can measure the absorbance with your instrument. You can figure out the path length that you're sending the light through based on your experiment. And based on the species that you're looking for, you know what the absorption coefficient is, so it can tell you the concentration. You can solve for concentration. Okay? So that's one example of doing that quantitatively. Now, common uses. You guys ever had to match paint? Probably not something that you do at your age, but your parents probably had to do that many times. Okay? Maybe when you were two, three, four, five years old, you liked to draw on the walls with crayons. And they had, had lovely colored walls for years. And then now they can't get rid of this, and they need to match that paint. So they take a little swatch, or they scrape off a little bit of the paint, they bring it into the store, they use a spectrophotometer, or in this case they call it a colorimeter, and they figure out how can we make this color exactly by mixing paints, different colors of paints in, in different dyes in this paint, so you can just go over and paint over all those crayons, you know, all the, the marks that are on the wall. Okay? So that's a really common use. And... <clears throat> they also can figure out if they're making paint all the same color. So when you buy paint, you know, if you buy it the same color two years from now, how would you know it's the same? So you have to have ways of testing it. The way you would test it is with colorimetry, which is a spectroscopy that's defining just the spectrum of the colors that we can see with our eyes. That's all colorimetry. is. So looking at color, but it's still spectroscopy. Now, in your... Yes, hopefully this will never happen to you, but if you get pulled over and they want to do a breathalyzer on you, okay, that can use optical means to do this. And it can check, using light, how much ethanol is in your sample. You breathe into this thing, it knows what the volume is, it knows how ethanol will respond to the specific light that's in this unit, sends a light through the volume of air that you breathe into this thing, and then it sees what the absorbance is. And it correlates that to concentration, blood alcohol concentration in this case. Okay? So it's a kind of a quick thing you can do. And paint matching we already talked about. Questions about that? If you know how ethanol responds to certain colors of light, and you have a sample of it, you can figure out what the concentration is. Yes? Is there always like a, a similar relationship between the amount of ethanol in your breath and the amount in your blood? Or does that vary by person? Like, just a lot you know, I don't know enough about that one to really comment on that. Jim, do you know anything about ethanol levels in your breath compared to in your blood? Good question. Uh, I don't know. And I know sometimes people will ask for a blood test. Sometimes the opposite. Mm -hmm. A blood test uh, instead. Uh, especially if you've had certain uh, things that might uh, yeah, so there's probably some issues. Probably in a, in a person that doesn't have any confounding factors, just drank. Probably it's pretty good. But it, it could be, potentially be confounded by other things that you might have done. <coughs> now, the nice thing about spectroscopy is that you can learn about something, you interact with it, but you don't touch it. Okay? So you basically put energy into the system and you see what comes back. I put light into it, and I see what happens to that light. Okay? Now, I could do this in a variety of different ways. I could put heat energy into something and see how that, temper that, that object changes temperature. I could put sound into something. I could put electricity into something. I could put chemistry into something and see how it reacts. I can put photons. 
I can put kinetic energy, pushing something, squeezing something. Okay? This is how I learn about the subject that I'm looking at. In our case, we're worried about using, we're concerned the most about using light to do these things. Okay? And you can imagine, light is a lot better than dousing it with some kind of chemistry, or heating something up, or squeezing it, or stretching it. Okay? But those are all valid forms of understanding matter or the materials that you're interested in studying. Just that we in biophotonics primarily use light. And <coughs> light carries visual information, but it can be used to also find out other information. It can be used to find out if something got squ was squeezed. If something was squeezed, okay? It can, be found, it, it can help you figure out things. It can be, help you tell you if something was stretched beyond its limits. So you can use light to figure out a lot of the effects of other forms of energy interactions as well. Now, a spectrum is what we tend to talk about a lot, and you guys will be taking spectra later on this month uh, as you do your next lab report, next experiments. And that's always a plot of energy detected versus the wavelength or the mass or the momentum or the frequency of the energy. Okay? But it's always some kind of energy measure versus some kind of intensity measure. Primarily we use wavelength versus intensity. Okay? And again, this can be emission, absorption, reflection, can be a whole bunch of different things. Those all can all be measured with intensity, the amount of reflection, the amount of absorption. Okay? You can use that. And they will make different looking graphs depending on which ones of those you use. <coughs> so, the way that we normally represent spectra, you saw that little diagram that we saw with the graph, but there's other ways too. You can sometimes just show a picture. We sometimes <coughs> tell you the counts of photons. So we say, at 343 nanometers, there were 500 photons. At 344 nanometers, there were 200 photons. We can tell you about absorption, but whenever we do absorption, we have to compare it to something. So if we have just pure water, we say, that's our zero point with no absorption, even though some absorption of photons occurs in that water. We say, that's our zero point, and then we add something to that water, and that difference, we've compared to a standard, and we can talk about transmission, I mean absorption. Transmission is instead of thinking of how many photons were absorbed, transmission is how many photons got through. So those two are intimately related. And reflection as well, you have to compare it to a standard. So in reflection, you commonly will look at reflection measurements off of surfaces, or when you're trying to figure out colors. And you have to have a standard, something that reflects your light source as close to 100% as possible. So you'll use things like Teflon or te things similar to Teflon, something very, very white that reflects all the energy that you're putting into it so that you can have a standard. Then you put something else, like your cloth or the color that you're trying to study, and you look at that difference. Okay? So for absorption, transmission, and reflection, the important thing is you have to have a standard. You have to have something you're comparing to. Otherwise, it's kind of worthless. Here's a solar spectrum. Okay? This is one of the highest resolution <coughs> solar spectra I've ever taken. And each line, you guys see one of these lines going across? Each one of these represents six nanometers of information. So this was done by an astronomical group trying to look at where all these little tiny lines were. Because all those little tiny lines tell you something about the sun and the way that the energy is created by the sun. And they also tell you something about what's in between the sun and wherever the detector was. Okay? Each one of those is some kind of transition of energy level for something. Okay? Let me actually, I forgot to turn that thing on. So each one of these corresponds to one of those jumps. You know how we have those energy levels? Each one of those corresponds to a jump. A photon was absorbed. That's what each one of these corresponds to. But there's lots of different species and lots of different excited states. So when you get something this accurate, you can tell a lot about what was in the way between the sun and your detector. Yes? Because there's multiple transitions there. There's... They're appearing this way just because there's 
there's several right nearby each other. What can happen there is you can have a whole bunch of um, rotational levels. And each one of those could be a rotational level. Do you guys remember how the big jumps were the electronic transitions? Then there were the smaller jumps, which were the vibrational transitions. And then the least energetic jumps were the rotational. Okay, remember it takes less energy to do this than it does to do this. And I won't even go into the excited because I'm going to have to tear my arm off or do something pretty dramatic, okay? <laughs> but that's kind of the range of things. So for a, different, for, for a given species, for a given transition, you can have electronic, rotational, and vibrational, with rotational being the smallest. So what you've got here is you've got a whole bunch of different compounds, atoms, and molecules with their own transitions, and for a given compound, there might be a set of rotational transitions here, a set of vibrational transitions here, and the electronic might be there versus here. These are all kinds of things overlaid about, upon each other. Very hard. The way that they have to do that is by doing the spectrum of the elements individually. So they take helium and do a really high resolution spectrum of just helium. They take hydrogen and do an individual spectrum of that. You have to take all those things individually and then overlap them on this and see which lines are caused by what. And then they go, wait, there's still some lines here. What are these caused by? And then they might realize, oh, we didn't heat our gas, original gas, to 10,000 Kelvin. So therefore, we're not getting the same transition. So they have to try to replicate the sun. And in a way, it helps them understand what's happening in the sun and what might be in there, in those reactions. Okay? So primarily helps them qualitatively figure out what's in there. It doesn't really tell them how much, okay, in this case. <clears throat> so, we can also take a picture, and you guys remember your paper spectroscopes? When you guys look at the fluorescent lights, they look kind of like that. You guys kind of remember that? You looked up, and there were lines, some were thicker, some were narrower. Well, I can represent it like that, like what you saw, or I can convert that into this. You guys notice, <coughs> okay, come on, oops, why can't I get my cursor? Well, can't get my cursor. Anyway, you see this broad line over here that's kind of reddish, and it has a, a brighter line in the middle of it, and then it gets kind of orange. Over here, it looks like that. You see peaks, where the brighter parts correspond to peaks. And you see this line is very bright, it's a very tall peak. Okay? And here they just tell you pixel, but you can convert this to wavelength. Okay? But the detector doesn't know wavelength either. The detector just knows this pixel got a whole bunch of photons, this pixel didn't. Okay? So that's the information that it would get. And this is where you look at a candle flame. You would have seen something similar if you were to look at a flashlight. And it looks, this kind of a thing like this, looks kind of like this. Okay? <coughs> so... What can you see from that information? I can figure out the atomic and molecular energy levels. I can think about geometries. I can figure out the shape of the molecule because when the molecule is in different shapes, it has different energies, so therefore the spectrum will be different. I can think of the chemical bonds, how it's interacting with other molecules. So if I have a situation where water is ice or water is slowly being warmed up, the interactions between water molecules are different. Therefore, the energies of the individual water molecules that I'm measuring are going to be different. And therefore, I'll see differences in the spectroscopy. I can identify components, and I can measure the amount of material in the sample. Okay? <clears throat> so, what tool do I need to do this? How do I actually get a spectrum and use spectroscopy? I need a source of energy. I need something to test. And I need something that will measure the change in the energy after it has interacted with the sample. That's what I need to do this, the tools. And so, I have a light source, and the light source can either be external, I can use the sun, or a special flashlight, or a laser, or it can be the sample itself. Okay? The sample itself can emit light. I need some mirrors, I need a diffraction grating. Anyone know what a diffraction grating does? This is, a, this is a hint. What do you think a diffraction grating might do? 
It's basically a flat prism. It just divides the, it spreads the spectrum out. It takes the light that comes in and spreads it into its component wavelength. <clears throat> okay, so it takes white light and makes a rainbow out of it. Spreads it out based on the energy of the light. And it does that just by having little tiny grooves, tiny uh, angles. <clears throat> a CD will do that. A CD will spread white light into its component colors. And anything that has very small regular spacings will do this. <clears throat> and I need a detector. And by detectors, remember I showed you guys the CCDs. They, some detectors are long and skinny. Some detectors are rectangular. And they have, you know, millions, thousands to millions of little detectors of light in them. And when I have all those things together, I get a spectrophotometer. What do spectrophotometers look like? Well, have you guys ever used a spectrophotometer? How many of you have? Do you guys remember what they were? Did, what did, they, did they look at any of these? Do they look kind of like this one? No. No? They look like that one? Yeah. Okay. Well, you guys are in good schools. Most schools have this kind, the Spec 20. The Spec 20, you take a little test tube, you stick your stuff in it, you pop it in there, you rotate the dial to one of five different wavelengths. Sometimes you actually can decide the wavelength. And it gives you a needle reading and tells you the measurement. Okay? We use this one, which I'll show you guys in a moment, working. It's right here. <coughs> okay? Really small. So, <coughs> actually, I'll show you that right now. Let me turn on the light. Okay. Okay. So, black box. Okay? Infamous black box. And I'll show you, in a moment, I'll show you what's inside this black box. And you guys will be using these later on this month. Fiber optic cable. Fiber optic cable brings the light that I want to study from this tip, brings it through into here. Inside here, there's mirrors, there's a diffraction grating, there's a CCD, and there's some circuitry. Sends the signal through a USB cable, goes into the computer. Okay? So, first thing I can do is look at our fluorescent lights. Notice what our fluorescent lights look like. They have a peak in the blue, they have a broader peak in the cyan. They have a big peak in the green. They have a broad peak, not as strong, in the yellow. They have a pretty strong peak in the red. And a smaller peak in the red. See how it's showing me that? And this is saying intensity or counts. So this is taking in 100 milliseconds, which is the <coughs> time up here. Every 100 milliseconds... <coughs> It's sampling the light, and it's saying, I get 22,000 pounds of yellowish red. And I only get, you know, about 2,000 pounds of the deep blue. Okay? And if we were to take something like, <coughs> let's see, I can get my LED to work. This LED has some problems. Well, I'm not going to get the... Oh, there we go. There's a red LED. Okay? Now, if I put this on the white screen, the white part of my screen, look at what I get. So, can you guys tell me, do I have a fluorescently lit screen or an LED lit screen? What is it? Okay, and why? I just expanded the scale right now. So you guys see that as a fluorescent. So you guys see that as looking like this. Okay. This is actually an LED lit screen. That's becoming the new rage now. It used to be, if I would have done this last year, I would have had a fluorescent lit one. <clears throat> Let's see yours. Let's look at a white screen. There you go. Is that as bright as it gets? There it is. Okay. I'm looking at his white. You guys see it looks a lot more like that? So he has a fluorescent lit screen, and I have an LED lit screen. 
Now, what other these are in there? Well, yeah, there's basically the, what they chose to use here is kind of like a blue, a greenish yellow, and an orange. Okay? The combinations of those yield different colors. So here, now I'm going to go over the rainbow. Now I'm on the blue part of the rainbow. Now I'm going over to the greenish part of the rainbow. Now I'm on the orange part of the rainbow. Now I'm on the red part of the rainbow. Did you notice that? Did you notice how they were varying the amounts? That combination yields the different colors, what appears to me like the different colors. Okay? Does that make sense? So, this device is really handy. This device can measure absorbance, it can measure transmission, it can measure reflectance, it can measure all those different things, just depending on if you have a standard. And it can also just measure count. <coughs> Bless you. Okay? So you guys will be using this for the experiments later on this month. I'll have seven of these, and each group will get one. Okay? So, this is, thank you, by the way. This is much, much handier than using those little spectroscopes. Because this tells me specific information, tells me exact intensities. I can tell a lot more with this than I can with that paper spectroscope. This costs $3,000. That other one costs $5, or $3. Right? So there's a big difference in what you can tell. But these are very handy, and these are used a lot in uh, also in machine vision. So when things are being manufactured and they want to do quick checks of what's happening with something, whether something is the right color, whether it's the right surface texture, uh, all kinds of things like that, they can do that using tools like this that instantly get a reading, and if something veers from what they think it should be, they send it off to be redone or it's a reject. Okay? So they're used a lot in those kinds of scenarios. They're also used, things similar to this can also be used to figure out sizes of droplets and paint, all kinds of different things. And these really fast tools are what make that possible. Okay, let's go back. <coughs> so, now we're going to, I'm going to show you a little movie of what's inside this thing. Huh? Here's the light. It goes into the fiber optic, travels through, hits a mirror, another mirror, diffraction grading, and then goes to the CCD, which then sends that information to my computer. Okay, let's dissect that a moment. So here we go. The light went into the fiber optic. And we know because of total internal, total internal reflection, the light makes it through all the bends, comes up, and then it hits mirror number one, and now you notice they show the light going out because you, you know even with a flashlight if you shine light it kind of separates out so in this case the it comes out of the he, up here and it's a little bit broader it hits mirror number one it hits mirror number two which is actually not a mirror but a diffraction grating so this is the part that separated the light that hit it into all the component colors okay <coughs> Then it hits another mirror. That mirror reflects it off onto the CCD. That's where there's, in this case, this is a USB 4000, so it has 4096 little sensors. And their position corresponds to the energy, to the wavelength. It's been calibrated using a known source, so they can figure out exactly which pixel is which wavelength. <coughs> And then it sends the information through the circuitry, through the USB, and it goes to the computer. Okay? The software that I have running. Now, why do you guys think there's an extra mirror here? Why don't they just send this directly to the CCD? They spread it out more. They spread it out more. Yeah. To increase the path so that the colors are more spread out. By spreading them out more, I can have a more accurate reading when I get to the CCD. Exactly. Okay. Now, if I use the CCD here that had 2,000 instead of 4,000 uh, detectors, what would the difference be in my results? Would it make any difference? Why would I use the more expensive one? Yes? More points per head means it's more accurate. I can get more resolution in a sense. I've got 4,000 points in which I've divided the spectrum instead of 2,000 points. 
So now I can say that each point is a half a nanometer rather than saying it was a full nanometer. Okay? Of resolution. That's all that does. Okay? And here's the actual, if you take one of these apart, here's what it looks like inside. What you see here is this is where the light goes in. That's the mirror. That's a diffraction grating, that round piece. It's a diffraction grating. This is the other mirror. And then that thing that you see there that's kind of this glow-in-the-dark greenish over there, that's the CCD array where the light's being captured. The wires is where the signal goes through, comes back to the other side, goes into the electronics, which sends that out the USB. Okay? So that's how that device operates. So, with that said, you guys have completed the whole basics of biophotonics. Okay? Now, from this point on, the rest of the course is really digging into some deep examples and trying some things yourself. Okay? That's what we're going to be doing for the rest of the course. <clears throat> and in terms of tools, we've covered all of these different tools in biophotonics. Okay? And these are the main points to make sure that you, you know at least this and a bit more based on the lecture. To think about the upcoming lectures, you're going to give an overview of CBST science now in the next few minutes. Next week, tour of CBST. I'm sorry, not next week. Wednesday, tour of CBST. We're going to meet outside at the... Um, do you know where the parking structure is? Out here? On the corner there? That's where we're going to meet to take the bus. Okay? There'll be a bus. It'll leave promptly at 10. So please make sure you're there on time. If you're not going to be there on time, let me know. <clears throat> you're going to get over there around 10.30. We're going to have about an hour over at CBST. That hour will consist of trying some things out on your own and also getting a tour of the facilities. At 11.30, the bus will promptly bring you back. may even leave a few minutes earlier than that. Bring you back so you can be back by noon, if not a little bit earlier. Okay? If there's any changes... I will send out an email, but I'm pretty sure that's where they're going to pick you up. That's what they did last year. Okay? Now, I want you to think creatively. It doesn't have to be anything that fancy, but it can be bring something to image. We have some really good microscopes, whether that is um, a hair, whether it's a pond sample from you know nearby your house, whether it's a leaf or a plant that you really like to see under the microscope. Bring something. And we'll have you take an image, and you'll get to save that image. And I'll, I'll, we may do something more with that image, but at the very least, you'll get the image back. You'll get a nice, high-resolution image of what you took. Okay? So make sure you bring something. I want to have a little gallery of objects that you guys have brought in. Yes? Should be some form of biological material? You know, if you really want to bring a rock, you can bring a rock. The types of microscopes that we have will look at things that are flat, or they'll look at things that are three-dimensional as long as they're not bigger than a fist. They'll be able to look at that. We have a microscope that's called a dissecting microscope that can look at those types of objects. Okay? And we also have a more regular microscope, and we have a fluorescence microscope. So we can do polarized microscopy, we can do phase contrast microscopy, we can do bright field microscopy, and we can do dark field microscopy. So, and we can, once we know what you're bringing, we can tell you once you're there what some of the best microscopies would be. Um, up to how little nanometers can it detect? Okay, so it, these are optical microscopes, so they can see bacteria. Okay, so bacteria, you know what the scale of bacteria are? What's the scale of bacteria? Anyone know? <laughs> She's saying 10 nanometers, I heard small. Any other thoughts? Bacteria? What? 1 to 200 nanometers? What are you? Uh, oh, so Our microscopes probably can see down to 500 nanometers, but not quite the absolute max of of what's possible. Maybe maybe 750 to 500 depends on the day. Um, bacteria are on the order of a few microns, or a few micrometers. Okay? When you guys are saying 100 to 200, that's a virus. And we can't see viruses. 
unless they were labeled and glowing, then we could see them. But we don't have that. Okay. You've got to exist. That's how we did the HIV movies that you guys might have seen. Yes? I have Last year, we weren't as well organized about getting images. So they were kind of last minute things. So people, you know, kind of put their shirt on there or grab their hair. Even you guys, a couple of days now to think about it. So think about what you want to bring. But, you know, plant material is fine. Your favorite pond out back, if you got an aquarium and you want to see if anything's really funny in there. Um, <clears throat> you ate fish and you got some fish skin you want to look at, you know, whatever. Really, you can, you can bring whatever you like. Okay? You know, within tasteful, re you know, <laughs> be tasteful about what you bring. <coughs> nothing, that, nothing that smells so horrible that we all have to leave the room, you know. But you could bring blue cheese if you wanted to. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter, okay? Whatever you're curious about and you want to see, okay? And then, on uh, the 9th, next week, you'll be learning about bioluminescent plants and the use of fluorescent markers. You'll hear from two um, folks here on campus, two different folks, that uh, have done a ton of work with C. elegans and also with plants, trying to understand the rhythms of plants and what they go through during the day by making them glow. Okay? So why don't you take a five-minute break. I'm going to go get Frank and have him set up. But I'm going to do two things, two things in the next hour. Uh, one is to provide you with kind of an overview. Now, I've, I assume you all know that there's this thing called the Center for Biophotonics that Marco and I and everybody else here work for. Um, I wanted to do is, is talk about how we're actually using biophotonics in medical uh, applications. And then after I've done this, I'm going to give you a preview. I understand you'll be visiting our center uh, later on this week. So um, before you go in to see the labs and all the technology, I wanted to explain a little bit about what that technology is about and how it works. Okay? Uh, so if you, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. But if, if it can wait until the end of the lecture, maybe I'll, I'll be able to finish everything in time. So first off, let me this is a talk I've given. I've uh, been on the road with this, this presentation a while. I've been to Moscow, I've been to China, I've been to Taiwan and Singapore. So uh, the subject of the talk is applying biophotonics to major challenges in medicine and the biosciences. All right. Uh, first off, just to introduce the idea that really our center is focused on uh, integrating uh, several disciplines at the same time. And we talk about interdisciplinary as well as translational research. And so uh, you guys are in integrated sciences, so I think you should be fairly familiar with the idea. But what we're trying to do here is combine basic research, basic science, with uh, engineering and medicine, all right? So it's the scientists who make the discoveries of fundamental laws and, and properties in nature, and then it's up to the engineers to take those discoveries and, and build something useful or some kind of gadget out of that. And ultimately, it's the doctors in medicine who use this technology to treat disease and then figure out what new technologies might still be needed, okay? So there's this whole cycle of information, who people who make the, the discovery at the front end, people who take that, just uh, take that information and translate it into something that's useful, and then the ones who apply it in the end. So there's this basic basic science and applied science that's here. Okay. So I'll re really quickly uh, define what biophotonics is about and introduce you to our mission. Talk about the need for biophotonics, and then I'll present some examples of what we're doing in the areas of cancer biology, cardiovascular disease, infectious disease neuroscience, neurological disease, stem cell research, and regenerative medicine. All right. And so, again, biophotonics, we call ourselves the Biophotonics uh, Science and Technology Center because there's two components. All right. One is the science. And so um, to understand the science of biophotonics is to look at the interactions between light and biological matter. We're also developing technologies, and so these are technologies that use light either to allow us to observe or manipulate biology. Right. Probably you've seen this graph before, but it talks about biology that it, uh, occurs at different scales from, you know, the atomic level all the way up to the whole body organism. And there are certain lengths that are associated with these different scales, right? And if you look at it, actually, uh, biophotonics plays a very critical role because it, you need to use the right tool to visualize biology at the right scale. And when you're talking about the scale of molecular systems, you're talking about a regime that can only be addressed using light. 
okay, visible light. And so it's, it's particularly useful for us. I mean, we've got uh, things that you can see with the unaided eye. Uh, you need optical microscopy as well as, you know, X-ray crystallography, electron microscopy. But in order to close this gap here that would allow us to look at molecular systems, biophotonics really plays a critical role. And as we know more and more about uh, medical diseases and what the molecular mechanism is, really it's important to have these tools to allow us to see what it is that we believe we're proving. All right, and so this is the place that you're going to be visiting uh, Wednesday. Uh, it's uh, over in Sacramento at the corner of the medical center out there. Uh, we're one of 13 active uh, centers sponsored by the National Science Foundation to pursue this, uh, this field. And you can see there's actually a, a number of different uh, uh, topics that are covered by other uh, science and technology centers by the NSF. <coughs> Bless you. Uh, this is not a, a UC Davis uh, program alone. Actually, the center is composed of 10 different research organizations, mostly in the Northern California area. It includes uh, Stanford University, UC Davis, UC San Francisco, UC Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and Lawrence Livermore Lab. And then uh, we, we also are very interested, unlike many other uh, science research centers, we're also focused on science education, as you guys know, and uh, as well as uh, industry outreach. And so that's kind of what sets us apart. And then from the educational side, we're trying to really improve the level of science literacy in underrepresented, among underrepresented uh, people, students. And so uh, UT San Antonio, Alabama A&M, Fisk University, traditionally black or Hispanic. Uh, schools, and so we're trying to uh, teach, kind of spread the gospel, and and show what uh, biophotonics is able to do. Okay, so finally, our, our on our research side, okay, we we have uh, many different projects, about 30 different projects on any, at any given time, and we divide them up in different ways. My job as associate director is pretty much to have a handle on all the projects, what's going on with them all at once. And so mentally for me, I was going to go through an exercise with you guys, but there wasn't enough time to kind of put you in the director's seat and have you guys design a biophotonic center, all right, and figure out, okay, what it is that you'd like to do research in and how would you organize it all. We spent many years trying to argue about what's the best way to organize our research plan. And so it hasn't really converged, but this is the closest that I can get. So we divided it in a couple of ways. One way is to divide it by topic, okay, and these are the ones in black. And so um, the three general theme areas that we support, one is uh, advanced imaging and spectroscopy. So this is purely technology development, okay, developing advanced microscopes and spectrometers to allow us to see biology in different ways. And then there are different ways to apply that technology. So one is in basic research, so using biophotonics to understand cell and molecular biology. We spend a lot of time with that. And then finally, the big app applied area is medical biophotonics, okay, developing new diagnostics and therapeutics. You can also divide our projects up into ones that are center-driven, meaning that the center feels that these are important enough that we fund these things entirely ourselves, all right, regardless of outside support. And then we have collaborator-driven projects in which an outside researcher really would like to work with us, and so they're providing, they kind of bring in their own money to sponsor uh, research that's in collaboration with CBST. And so those are the ones where we pretty much focus on in terms of applied medicine. All right. So what's the need for biophotonics in medicine? I think I talked a little bit about this in the cancer talk. But basically, there are three areas in medicine where biophotonics can play a major role. Two of them are more or less diagnostic, and then one is therapeutic. So from the, op from the diagnostics point of view, there are two things that we can do with biophotonics. One is to be able to identify and characterize a disease, meaning that if I, say for example, I were to hold up a, a specimen of tissue in front of you, and ask you, is this normal or is this abnormal? How would you figure out if it was a disease or not? Okay, that's what we're trying to do with research in this area. So can we use biophotonics to analyze a, a piece of tissue to figure out whether this is healthy or diseased? All right, and so this applies to cancer, infectious disease, what have you. The other major task that we try to, to focus on is locating a disease. Okay, it's one thing for me to hold a sample out to you and tell you, is this, is this sick or healthy? But it's another thing to say there's a, you know, you're sick, but I don't know where the disease is coming from. This can happen if you have an infection. You could have a tumor that's spread, and you don't know where in the body it's located. And so this is the famous Star Trek gadget, the tricorder, right, that would kind of scan the body to say, oh, there, no, there's something in your leg or there's something in your brain, all right? And so we're trying to develop non-invasive tools that would diagnose the disease somewhere in your body. 
Okay, it's two different tasks. One is trying to distinguish between healthy and diseased tissue, and the other one is trying to locate diseased tissue somewhere, somewhere in the body. And then the therapy side. So these two are, are diagnostic, this one is therapeutic. So how can we use light to treat a disease? And I talked a little bit about photodynamic therapy last week, right, about how you would treat a tumor, uh, tumor in the neck just using laser light and a special drug that's activated by light. <clears throat> okay, so um, in terms of specific examples of how we're applying biophotonics in medicine, this was the example that I had given last week talking about PDT. Oh, I'm sorry, about uh, developing biophotonics to detect prostate-specific antigens. So PSA is a specific marker for can uh, prostate cancer, and they were making use of this reaction of luciferin and luciferase producing light. And this is a reaction that occurs in a fireflies. It doesn't normally occur in humans. So we can make use of these reagents, these chemicals, to produce a, a laboratory assay that can tell us specifically whether or not prostate-specific antigen is present. Okay, I think I also talked about this one. And so this was, this was uh, developing an advanced endoscope that can look into your esophagus to determine when, you know, if you're a person who's got gastric reflux and constantly exposing your esophagus to stomach acid, when are you going to convert from this thing called Barrett's esophagus to true esophageal cancer? Oh, man, we talked about all this stuff. Okay, no wonder I can slide through this. Um, we, this is the, the talk again about autophagy, which is a, a cellular process of cell recycling, okay, as opposed to cell death, cell suicide, uh, which is apoptosis. And so um, using advanced uh, imaging, we're able to visualize this process, and we're hopefully going to develop an assay that can tell us how well a chem chemotherapeutic drug is working. Come on. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, wait. There go. Okay, sorry about that. All right, next, moving away from cancer is in the area of cardiovascular disease, okay? In the United States and other Western civilizations, uh, cardiovascular disease is probably still the, the major killer, all right? Probably outnumbers cancer um, in terms of uh, causing, causing death and fatalities. So one of the big areas in cardiovascular disease, aside from just understanding what's the mechanism of, you know, what happens after you eat a Big Mac at McDonald's, is to, is to um, develop a tool that allows us to characterize the atherosclerotic plaques. So cardiovascular disease is when you eat a fatty meal and the fat deposits in the lining of your blood vessel walls, okay? Now, your major arteries, usually it's not a major a problem, but in the smaller arteries, the arteries that supply blood to the heart, right? The heart is tissue that needs oxygen itself. And so you've got the coronary arteries that supply blood to the heart, okay? That's fairly small, and it can get blocked if you have a little fatty plug that gets in there, all right? The, the, the main thing that a lot of people don't understand is that it's not the percentage of blockage of that vessel. It's more a question of whether that blockage is stable or if it's unstable. Okay? You could have a vessel that's 90% blocked, but if it's a stable plug, meaning that it's not changing very much over time, then your body deals with it. Okay? The, the main thing that a doctor is concerned about is whether that plug is going to rupture, okay? Because this is some, it's a, this is kind of like a, a swelling, an inflammation that occurs. And if that inflammation occurs slowly, okay, that, that plaque isn't going to change over time. So yesterday you were 90% occluded, tomorrow you're going to be 90% occluded, next month you're still going to be 90% occluded. Fine, deal with it. But if this thing should rupture, okay, even if it's like 10% occluded, if it ruptures, suddenly the blood is going to form a clot over that and you're going to have a stroke, okay? And that's the main thing that doctors are concerned with. It's not how much of a blood vessel is blocked by this plug, but whether or not that plug itself is going to rupture and cause a blood clot, and that's going to kill you, okay? So in order to figure this out, it turns out that uh, there are a number of techniques that we're developing that can help us uh, look at this. One thing is to look at the structure of collagen. Collagen is a molecule that forms connective tissue. 
and um, this this material, this uh, this molecule, it's uh, this long fiber, and if it gets laid down over time, it ends up being very well organized. Okay, like looking at the grain of wood. All right, and uh, if it, if if a plaque develops quickly, the collagen fibers tend to be laid down in a chaotic fashion. All right, and it turns out the collagen itself is a fluorescent molecule. Do you guys know about fluorescence? Okay, so, so it's a fluorescent molecule, but the thing is that when we look at not at the fluorescence, we're not looking at the fluorescence wavelength, we're looking at the fluorescence lifetime. Any, guys, any of you have a guess as to what fluorescence lifetime is? Okay, so fluorescence, oh, go ahead. Close, yeah, really close. So, so a fluorescent molecule basically absorbs photons and then takes that energy to re-emit a new photon. So it might absorb a blue photon and emit a green photon, all right? Now, the, it's not instantaneous. It takes a couple of nanoseconds for this to happen, all right? And we have the instrumentation to actually measure how long it takes for a molecule to absorb light and then re-emit it again. And that's the fluorescence lifetime, okay? And it turns out that collagen, okay, even though it's fluorescing perhaps in the red, in the red color, it doesn't shift its wavelengths when the collagen is organized or disorganized, but it changes its lifetime. So when the collagen is, is uh, well organized, it has a lifetime of something around 14 nanoseconds. But if it's disorganized, it has a lifetime of two nanoseconds. And so we have the fancy electronics, a stopwatch that's in sync with a pulse laser source. All right? And pulse laser is shining light on the plaque inside the, the coronary artery or in the carotid artery. And it looks to see what's the average lifetime of collagen fluorescence. All right? And if the lifetime is long, it means that it's well organized, it's a stable plaque, don't worry about it, you don't need to treat it. But if they measure the lifetime and it's short, well, then that means that the collagen inside is disorganized and you're looking at a very unstable plaque, all right? And so then a, an interventional radiologist might have to go in with a stent or do something to basically stabilize that plaque. So do you guys get it? That's, that's basically what we're trying to do with this technology here, okay? <coughs> Infectious disease, so this is another area. This is, this is my uh, particular... Uh, uh, area of expertise. And so here we're looking at uh, the mechanisms of HIV. Okay. Um, there, there's been some question as to how HIV transmits from cell to cell. Most of you know that uh, uh, HIV is, a pretty, is an unusual virus in that it infects white blood cells, right? White blood cells are the very mechanism that your body uses to fight infectious disease, and your virus is basically hiding inside the very cells that are supposed to attack it. So that's its mechanism for bypassing, bypassing the immune system. And so the question is, how does that HIV spread? All right? And most people um, have in their mind when they think about viral infections and spreading is that a virus swims around looking for some cell to infect. It infects that cell, and basically that, that uh, infected cell will produce many, many copies of that virus, okay, of HIV, eventually reaching a point that the virus just explodes out of the cell, and they got a lot of free HIV to go infecting other cells. Well, what happened was that um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that maybe there's a different mechanism involved, and we were trying to look into that. And really, the only way we could do this is to um, basically apply two, two concepts at the same time. One of them was to develop a fluorescent HIV using green fluorescent protein, which you may have heard won the Nobel Prize this year. So, so um, a colleague of mine over at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York was one of the first to develop a fluorescent clone of HIV. Other people have tried to develop a fluorescent HIV, but it ended up being a non-infectious virus. So you could take that clone and put it in a cell, and that cell would sure enough produce fluorescent virus, but that fluorescent virus would never go on to infect other cells. So you couldn't use that to study how HIV spreads. But this guy over in New York figured out where to put the GFP so that it wouldn't interfere with the ability of the virus to infect. And so now we have the ability now to track it, okay? And we use this uh, system that I'll talk about shortly called the spinning disk 3D microscope. And what this does, it produces very high-quality three-dimensional movies of what's going on. And so this is, these are movies now of uh, a cell that's infected, okay? And you can tell it's infected because it's fluorescing green, all right? That green is uh, from the HIV. So this is, this is HIV that's now spreading by direct cell contact to a CD4 positive T cell. Okay, T cells is a specific target of HIV. And so you can see here now that, that a little bundle is basically pinching off the infected cell and being transported into the, uh, the uninfected cell. 
this is amazing because any HIV researcher that looks at this realizes now that this has major implications in terms of trying to develop drugs, antivirals against <coughs> HIV. Bless you. Um, in the past, people have been trying to develop an AIDS vaccine, and an AIDS vaccine works by having the, the person who's been vaccinated build up antibodies against HIV, right? And those antibodies supposedly are going to attack HIV. Well, the thing is that if this mechanism holds out, then those antibodies have nowhere to attack because that HIV is never out in the open. Basically, it's tunneling from one cell to another, and that's how it's spreading, okay? And that would explain why we haven't been able to develop an HIV vaccine yet, all right? So, so it's uh, it's been pretty it's been pretty amazing. We just uh, had a paper that's been accepted for publication in Science, and so we're really jazzed about that. But uh, the improvements using this technology have been tremendous because our uh, our collaborator in New York before this was using a regular fluorescence microscope, and this was about the resolution that he was able to get, all right, with the same system, but not using our optics. And so it's kind of like comparing the uh, surveillance video at a 7-Eleven holdup or something like that compared to looking at something with HDTV, all right? And so, so it's a tremendous amount of information that we can get. And um, again, since this is a 3D movie, it means that you can actually freeze frame any frame in that movie and then rotate the model around. And so that's what you're seeing here, right? And then you can actually take that movie and replay it from a totally different perspective. And so that same movie that you saw in the previous view graph is now being redisplayed here from the perspective of that T cell that's getting infected. All right, and so now we can actually do a lot of detailed studies looking at the, I think, do I have it? Oh, no, not here. But you can do very detailed um, analysis showing how fast the virus is moving, how much of it is getting transported. And so we're developing a new model, and that new model actually involves kind of a mechanism where the virus uses like a Trojan horse to get into, to gain entry into the uninfected cell. And once it's inside that cell, then it proceeds to infect it. But it's a two-step process. And so we're hopefully going to be able to have new targets now to develop uh, anti antiviral uh, medication against HIV. We do a lot of work in neuroscience as well. Um, traumatic brain injury is another big area of research, especially with the Gulf War. Uh, a lot of uh, people in the military are suffering from uh, traumatic injury, either from impact or from blasts. And so in order to see what's going on and understand the mechanism of how somebody gets injured and how fast they can recover, we really want to study how the brain works and how functional it is. In particular, we're looking at the blood-brain barrier. This is, this is what protects the, uh, the brain against uh, a lot of foreign chemicals. And what happens is that that barrier breaks down during traumatic brain injury, and so all of a sudden these toxic chemicals get in and they can attack the brain. And so what we're trying to do is look at the brain, blood-brain barrier using this little endoscope. And so this is a device that's actually not much bigger than the dime, all right? And it, it can be fit on top of a, a little mouse's brain. <laughs> and so, so this mouse has this thing on top, and it can go walking through mazes, and we can see the living brain in action, how the blood is flowing into the brain, and we can tell what happens when, uh, when the mouse should experience a traumatic brain injury. And uh, we have a postdoc here who does this, and they call it donking. They, they, you have this very precise device that will donk the, the mouse on the head, and the uh, mouse gets all, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, it takes a special personality to, to enjoy this type of work, but, but he does it. Right? We also have uh, a major focus in regenerative medicine. And so uh, UC Davis has a stem cell program, and so they're hoping to develop stem cells that can be used for medical treatment. And that's going to require a special facility where you're culturing cells that are FDA approved to be implanted into a person who might have um, Alzheimer's disease, and you want to somehow treat that disease using stem cells. And so um, in that particular case, we need a special technology that allows us to analyze the cells and figure out whether or not it's an undifferentiated stem cell or if it's a cell that's already started to differentiate into a heart cell or into a neuron or what have you. Um, I think I mentioned this a little bit before talking about leukemia last week. And so this, this same technology is being used to identify stem cells in complex mixtures. Um, this, this technology is called laser trap Raman spectroscopy, and I'll get into that in the next, uh, in the next section. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's a real quick overview of some of the medical applications that we're doing. And then any questions on this? If not, then, 
Yeah. No. They're just going back to Colossus' lifetime. Yeah. What was this? It's the time between the something receiving light and re retransmission light. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so the lifetime of a fluorescent molecule. So you can actually we have a tool, uh, which I'll show you, which is capable of looking and measuring the the uh, it can detect a single photon that's emitted. And so this particular instrument is coupled to a pulse laser system. Right. And the pulse laser system just keeps firing firing pulses of, of light and it's attached to a stopwatch. And basically the stopwatch goes as soon as the pulse is emitted and then it waits on the super sensitive detector for the first first fluorescent photon to arrive. And when it does, it stops the clock and it measures it. And you do this enough times you can get a, a sense of what's the average lifetime. All right, and that's what's fluorescent lifetime. Okay? Good question. <coughs> so, let me go to the other one. So this is now going to be a preview of This is now going to be a preview of some of our technologies at the Oak Park Research Facility in Sacramento. Again, same slide. So this is the layout. Uh, you'll see that it's a building that's dedicated for uh, CBST. Uh, hopefully when, I, I know the facility director, is it Sebastian that's going to give the tour? All right. I, I think I'm going to be there too, unless I'm going to be somewhere else. Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. So, so maybe I'll join with Sebastian on the tour. But um, the, the building was built specifically for CBST and uh, in the laboratories. So the main thing, as opposed to a biology lab, uh, how many of you guys have worked in a biology lab before? How many of you have worked in a laser lab before? <laughs> okay, so, so the, main thing with, the main thing with a biology lab is they, they like to keep things sterile, okay, because you're culturing cells and tissues, and so you don't want germs floating around, and you don't want your samples to get contaminated. So usually in a biology lab, everything, the key word is sterility. Everything needs to be just clean, okay. But, the, but in a laser lab, the main thing is stability. We need our, our labs to be rock solid, no vibrations. And you might ask the question, well, why does it need to be why does it need to be so stable? It's because we do our work on these special tables called optical benches, all right? And the optical benches are floating on a cushion of air. It's these massive tables, but the legs are filled with compressed air, and so, so you can hear it, okay? And when you go in there, make sure you ask permission, but you can go up to the tables and push down on it. And when you push down on it, you'll hear this hissing of gas. Okay, and so the whole thing is floating on a cushion of air, and the reason is because on these optic setups, we usually have a laser that's mounted on top, and the laser is going through mirrors and lenses, and all of this is focusing down on a single cell or a single molecule. All right, and I normally will, uh, when I'm giving a tour myself, I'll hand uh, somebody a laser pointer, and I ask them to focus on a spot that's close, right, and they have no problem with that. But then that same spot across the room, I tell them to focus on it, and their hand's just going all crazy, all right. And then I ask the question, well, why do you, what do you think is going on, right? Is it that when you have to focus on something far, your hand suddenly becomes more jittery? Probably not. But the thing is that small angle displacements over a short distance result in small displacements. Those same angular displacements over a longer distance result in huge, huge translations, right? And so if I did it here, right, I could, I could keep it on a one centimeter spot, but across here I'd be challenged to hold my spot, you know, within one centimeter. Okay, because of the longer distance. So it's basic geometry we're talking about. What we do with our, our setups is that we've got lasers that are focusing, that are, that are going through these configurations that sometimes extend the length of the room. And so if somebody comes stopping in, right, or speaking in a loud voice, hey, what's going on? That's enough to, that's enough to cause that laser spot to, to move all over the place. And so the, the building itself, if you look under, underground, we have an underground parking lot. The columns underneath the labs are doubled where those are, and then plus these optical bench tables uh, that have sit on a cushion of air really provide for totally, totally um, uh, dead, you know, uh, no vibration uh, environments. And so that's, that's pretty cool. But anyways, you'll, you'll be able to see all that. Skip this. All right, so, so a couple of, of key technologies that are here. Uh, one is called the deconvolution microscope, and that's here. Uh, this microscope is, is uh, a very convenient way for us to obtain um, high-resolution 3D images, like the ones you saw of the HIV and for the autophagy. Uh, uh, this setup, this is built by a company called Applied Precision, which is a, which is a company up in Seattle, and I think that 
Yeah, you'll see these are these are different views. A, a lot of these uh, use a conventional microscope up front, but then they have fancy fancy um, software to do image analysis to provide you with very clean images. Um, the way that it works, and I don't know if this is the best slide to show you, uh, but the way it works, it's basically um, a, a different way. Have you heard of confocal microscopy? Oh, okay, so confocal microscopy is a special, it's, it's, it's the kind of microscope that allows you to take very sharp pictures through the middle of a cell, for example. So it's kind of like the equivalent of a CAT scanner or an MRI scanner for humans, but this is at the cellular level. So a microscope that can basically slice through a cell and provide you with a picture of what's going on right through the middle without actually cutting through it, okay, is what this thing is able to do. And it makes use of this pinhole, pinhole aperture Right, that produces a very sharp focus within the middle of the cell. Um, that's, that's the standard technique that's used in other laboratories. But in a deconvolution scope, what you're doing is you're deblurring an image by examining more closely what happens to a single fluorescent molecule. Right, every single fluorescent molecule in a sample that you have is, is blurred out. Right, by a specific amount based on the type of optical system you have. And if you know how much it spreads, then you can basically back calculate from, from whatever image you get to figure out where's the original distribution of fluorescent molecules that are in that sample. And so this process is called deconvolution, and that's basically how it works. So each, each one of these fluorescent molecules produces a distribution of light, right, that you can see here. And when you get rid of that additional blur, because all you really care about is the location of the original fluorophore itself. And so by subtracting out all this blur above and below, you end up with a sharper picture. And that's, what, that's essentially what deconvolution is trying to do. And so an example of what you can see with... Uh, so these are, these are pictures of uh, neurons together with astrocytes. And so you can, uh, you can see here, these are examples of pictures. I don't have a picture of, of one without. So these are, these are essentially high resolution pictures that you can get with the deconvolution scope. And just trust me, I guess, when I say that you couldn't get this as easily with a confocal microscope, all right, because these are three-dimensional images. And you definitely wouldn't see this level of detail in a regular fluorescence microscope. All right. Um, in the same room where the deconvolution scope is, is our, our most expensive and fancy toy right now. And this is called the OMX for uh, Optical Microscope Experimental. And so, so um, the deconvolution scope was on one side of the room, and then the whole other half of the room is dedicated to this OMX system. And the OMX system is, uh, is interesting because it's the world's most powerful optical microscope, meaning um, most optical microscopes have a certain limit to how small you can you can distinguish two points, and so normally you can you can uh, separate two points that are no closer than about 250 nanometers apart. Okay, there's a there's a rule in optics that basically says that you can't tell two two points that are closer than that with visible light. Um, this thing overcomes that by using some fancy optical tricks, and so this is you see more pictures of the OMX system here. But the basic idea is that you're working with uh, with light in Fourier space, and this is the this is a uh, kind of a difficult concept to explain the first time. But if you think of it in terms of uh, this phenomenon called the Moiré effect, so here, suppose that uh, so this is a form of, of fluorescence microscopy where you're dealing with the distribution of fluorescent molecules that are in a very very fine pattern. Okay, and you may not be able to see that pattern. But if I were to, to superimpose on that unknown pattern, some kind of known pattern, all right, you'll end up with these things called moiré fringes. And you probably have seen this if you'd say take two pieces of stocking and, and overlay them on each other. Oh, you have done that? Okay. So the fact is that the people in the back of the room would probably be able to see these moiré fringes, right? But they wouldn't be able to, to identify the fine pattern itself. And since this is a mathematical relation, you should, in principle, be able to figure out, all right, if I were to use a special type of structured illumination, all right, instead of just uniform white light, I use light which is patterned, 
All right. And I use this light to excite my, my uh, fluorescently labeled sample. I should be able to back calculate and figure out what's the original distribution of fluorescent molecules. And so with this system, we're getting out the door 100 nanometer resolution, which is twice as, which is, um, twice as good as, as the best fluorescence microscope available. And we're hoping to bring this down closer to something like 40 or maybe even 10 nanometers, if possible. All right, and so these are just examples um, of, these are just fluorescent beads that are in a solution. And so you can see that with a conventional microscope, if I had the magnification turned up all the way to say 100x, and I'm looking at these uh, microbeads, this is about the picture that I could get. Right? <coughs> using the deconvolution scope that I was telling you about, this is what you can get. All right, now using the structured illumination OMX, this is what you get. Okay, and so you can see here that there's definitely an improvement in the picture quality. And you might say, well, so what? You know, what does this get you? Well, um, HIV, for example, is about maybe 70 nanometers or 100, 100 nanometers in diameter, and which means that using OMX, we could actually see individual virus particles. You wouldn't be able to see this with a... If you saw a dot using a regular microscope, you couldn't tell whether there were one or 10 uh, HIV viruses. But with this, you could identify whether there were one or 10 viruses. So this will hopefully allow us to quantitate our images much better. All right, another example of what you can see with uh, deconvolution versus OMX. Okay, so this one is the spinning disc microscope. This is what we were using to obtain the 3D movies of HIV. Uh, again, this is a this is a uh, this is a setup. Oh yeah, and this is the optical bench that I was telling you about. So the legs, bless you. So the legs here are filled with uh, compressed air. And really, the um, what's special about the spinning disc system is this box. All right, this box is a confocal scanning unit. And so this takes, this takes the idea of a confocal microscope and multiplies it by 1,000. Because what it does, essentially, is, is it takes the idea of the pinhole in the confocal microscope and multiply it many, many times so that you have this spinning disk that's got these little pinholes around it. And the end effect is that this device, all right, this confocal scanning unit, will take a laser beam and then spray it through space. And so it's kind of like the, the, um, what happens at the checkout of a supermarket, you know, how the person is just scanning items over the, over the register. And it's because there's this laser beam that's just scanning in space, looking for something to see, right? And so what this device does, this spreads out, takes a laser beam, splits it in multiple directions so that it's simultaneously acquiring these confocal images through the cell. So the end result is that it's able to take about 600 frames a second Okay, throughout the volume, whatever volume you're interested in looking at. And as a result, we can get very fine, uh, very detailed um, 3D movies uh, in video rates with, with these devices. Okay, so again, this is, this is just showing how we used that, uh, this microscope to look at the uh, HIV infections. And so this is a picture of the uh, infected T cell that's touching two CD4 positive T cells, all right? And it's only, it's going to end up spreading its virus to this one, but not to this one. And why it's doing that, we don't know yet. So that's part of the research that we're doing. And so this same picture, if I looked under fluorescence, would look like this. Zooming in, you see the infected cell. And then here you don't see the uninfected cell because it doesn't have fluorescent virus in it. But you can see at the point of contact, there's this bright spot. And that bright spot is where all the HIV is collecting, basically like pirates trying to board a cruise ship. Um, where they're basically at the point where the two cells are docked, the, the, cell, the virus is going to start jumping across. Right? And so you guys see this. Any questions about this one? Okay. All right. Um, the next... The next major system that I wanted to talk about was called laser trap Raman spectroscopy. Now, there are two concepts that are uh, involved here, and I'll talk about the first one, I think, which is uh, Raman, Raman spectroscopy. But these are pictures of the optical system. We actually have a, this has been a very popular technique, and so as a result, we've needed to build uh, multiple systems to accommodate for all the researchers at the Med Center that want to use it. So we built, uh, we worked with a company in Germany to produce this little robotic microscope, and it's called the TIL microscope, so it's right here. And it looks kind of like R2-D2, so, so that's what we call it. But it's this little box 
that uh, is capable of doing everything that the larger system is, is able to do, but because of the smaller size, we can actually take this out on the road. And so at science conferences where we wanted to demonstrate how this technique works, we can actually show them hands-on how, how the technology works. Another picture of, uh, of the tail microscope. And so the basic idea here, and I don't know if I have a better, better view graph, but um, the, the first thing, and okay, I, I'm sorry, I have a, a, things are out of order. Let me, let me just switch. Okay, so this is probably the best one. The, um, the basic idea with Raman, okay, uh, we, we, can, we tend to analyze things by the, the color of light that we see, okay, and so my shirt is blue because it's taking white light, absorbing all wavelengths except blue, and blue is scattering off of my shirt, and that's what you see, okay. Blue light that hits my shirt <coughs> that gets scattered as blue light, that's called Rayleigh scattering, okay, it's a form of elastic it's an elastic scattering, meaning that, uh, that the energy coming in is equal to the energy going out. All right. And this is, this is usually what happens when light scatters off of a material. But there is a small component of light that gets scattered inelastically, okay? meaning that light comes in at one energy, one energy and it goes away with a slightly different energy. So it, it happens rarely. Maybe one out of every 10 million photons gets scattered this way. But what happens then is that a blue photon will hit my shirt and, and interact with the pigments of my shirt and then scatter as green, okay? And you don't see that green component because it's only one out of 10 million, all right? But it's there. And it tells you something about the material that's in my shirt, okay? Because, because what, the, uh, what that photon is doing, it's interacting with these different vibrational modes with the chemicals inside, inside my shirt, all right? Now, you know that molecules are composed of atoms that are that are uh, held together with these chemical bonds. And each of these chemical bonds is kind of like a, a spring or a trampoline. And so you jump on the trampoline and that trampoline starts to vibrate, okay? And depending on what that vibrational mode is, because you could be stretching the bond, you could be bending the bond, you could be twisting the bond. Each one of these is associated with different energy. And so if I were to be able to measure the amount of light, the, the amount of energy that's changed in the light that's coming in versus the light that's going out, then that might tell me something about that chemical bond that I just interacted with. So it could have been a CH bond, it could have been a CO bond, it could have, C, it could have been a C, CC or C double bond C. All of these have different energies associated with their, with their chemical bonds. And so Raman's spectroscopy is the study of light which is scattered inelastically from material. Okay. There's a, it's a whole area of science, but we're able to, to study this, and basically using this technique, we can determine kind of the chemical composition of a sample without having to do analytical chemistry, without having to take that sample apart and analyze it, okay? So just shining light, just shining laser light on an object, we can measure its Raman spectra and figure out what it's all about. So in a nutshell, that's what Raman spectroscopy is about. I'm, I'm sure that my colleagues would laugh at that explanation, but hopefully that gives you an idea of what, what it is, and we'll talk more about that in the future. But going back now to this setup, right, with, this, with this laser trap Raman spectroscopy, that's what we're trying to do. And so, so the, the purpose of this setup is to be able to develop a technique that we could analyze cells non-destructively without needing to use any kind of fluorescent labels. All right, to figure out what's its chemical profile. And so the spectrum that you end up getting, these are typical Raman spectra of whole cells, okay? And so what this is, it's a graph of light intensity versus energy shift, all right? So if I were to use uh, light from a laser, so uh, laser is monochromatic light, meaning all the photons that are coming out of this device is one wavelength, okay? In this case, it's, what, 530... Yeah. Right. So, 532. Okay. So five. Who said 534? <laughs> okay. So five, 534, 532. But it's a very specific, well-defined wavelength. All right. If I use this light to shine on my shirt, okay, you're still seeing green light, okay, because there's some white fibers in in my shirt enough to scatter that green light. 
Okay, so you see that. But there is a small component that's going to get scattered yellow or get scattered red, and you don't see it, but we have the tools to measure those photons. Okay, I use a filter to block out 532, and I let, let pass any light that's not 532. Okay, and then I get spectra, and I'll get this. Okay, so this gives me a breakdown of all the, all the Raman scattered photons. And then this signature is a signature of the chemicals that are inside my shirt. Okay, and if I do this on cells, well, then this becomes a signature for that particular cell. And so I could tell the difference between a blood cell versus a neuron. I could look at a, an immune cell, a macrophage, and tell whether it's activated or not activated. I could look at a stem cell and determine whether it's differentiating or it's quiescent. So these are, these are the different things you can do with Raman. The question, the, the problem here is that it takes about 30 seconds to collect that spectra. And if I'm doing this under the microscope, in 30 seconds the cell can kind of drift right across my field of view and I won't be able to see it anymore. So I need to hold it down long enough for me to collect the spectrum. And in order to hold it down, I need some special technology, and this is where the laser trap component comes in. And so the laser trap is the idea, I don't know if you've seen at a, at a fair, a science fair or something like that. If I take a vacuum cleaner and I set it on exhaust, I can balance the tennis ball in the flow of, of air outwards. So it's kind of like that, where I'm taking a, a focused laser beam, and then I can actually trap an object within, the, within that focus. It turns out that um, a cell, a human cell, because it's able to refract light, it's changing the momentum of the light. And so for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? Basically Newton's law. And so because that cell is refracting the light, there's a certain force that the light is, in, is actually acting on that cell, and it causes that cell to stay trapped in the vortex that's created by that focus beam, all right? So without actually touching that cell, I'm able to hold it still in suspension, all right? So that's, that's terrific. So that means that without having to touch the cell, I can hold it still and I can analyze it to figure out what chemicals are inside of it. All right. And the same light that I'm using to hold that cell, that's my light source for the Raman scattering. Right. And so if it's a green laser, then I'm using 532 uh, wavelength light. And so then, then I'm looking for any photons that are not 532 to scatter from that object for me to collect the Raman spectrum. Okay. I'm sorry that I don't have more, more, uh, pictures to help illustrate this point. Uh, I'm still working on this presentation. But in the end, what happens is if I look at many cells and many spectra, uh, we're looking at stem cells over at the Med Center who's trying to use stem cells to repair heart tissue after a heart attack. And the idea here is that you start out with embryonic stem cells, and based on their spectra, they might fall onto this part of the graph. And what he wants to do is differentiate them so that they're actually cardiac my myocytes or heart muscle cells, all right? And using the same technique, the, the spectra would land in this region, okay? And so he's showing that using this technique, we can follow as the cells go from the undifferentiated embryonic stem cell state into the differentiated heart cell state, okay? And there's this green area where the cells are in transition from one state to another, okay? Um... Raman, the, and this is, uh, this is another technique. Uh, it's called coherent anti-Stokes Raman scattering. And this is a, another technique for trying to speed up the process of Raman scattering. All right? um, what I told you before with uh, shining light on an object and, and waiting for one out of every 10 million uh, photons to scatter inelastically, that's called spontaneous Raman. Okay. And so it's a very slow process. And what we're trying to do is create a more active form of Raman uh, measurements. And this would be coherent anti-Stokes. And the idea here, and this is, this is uh, uh, you'll, you'll see this on your tour, but basically on top of this table is about three quarters of a million dollars worth of optics, including two tunable lasers here. And, uh, <clears throat> and then there's a microscope at the end of all of this, all, at the end of all this optics technology. But the basic idea is now to actively seek out, okay? What we do with spontaneous Raman is we shine light, and that light might interact with a CH bond. It might act with a CO bond. It could act with any number of bonds. But what we're doing with the car system is we're specifically tuning to one particular resonance frequency so that we're actively seeking out any and all chemical bonds that are C double bond O, for example, okay? And then... Uh, by actively pulsing for that particular uh, chemical bond, we can collect our information much faster and with much higher resolution. So now you can actually create images. And those images would map out what's the distribution or what's the location of all the CH bonds within my sample. Okay. And so, so um, there's a, a great deal of uh, 
of science behind all of this, but the basic idea is that you're using very high power lasers to bombard your sample with lots and lots of laser light. All right? And the reason you need to do this is because there's a very unusual interaction that takes place. Let me just... Yeah, so, so the idea here is that you're bombarding your sample here with green light. Okay, and then these, these are different electronic or energy states of your sample. And the idea is that if you pump it with enough light, you actually can get this, this up-down, up-down process to occur where you're energizing your sample, it relaxes, it energizes again, and then it relaxes. And there's a certain probability that you're going to end up with light which is actually more energetic than the light that you started with. Okay, so you might have gone in with green light, but you end up with blue light coming out. That happens very rarely. Okay, and so um, this process is very, it's rare, but it's also very specific for the sample that you're looking for, or whatever chemical bond you're looking for. And so this is what coherent anti-Stokes Rowland is about. And um, as a result of this kind of technique, now you can specifically look for certain chemicals, like I said before. And in this case, we're very good at detecting lipids. Okay, and lipids, as you probably know, these are fat molecules, basically. And so these, these contain the, uh, uh, the chemicals like cholesterol, like, uh, like the, the molecules that are in the plasma membrane. Whenever you eat a fatty meal, this is, these are the type of chemicals that get uh, uh, distributed throughout your body and absorbs this into your bloodstream. And so we can actually observe where these uh, lipids are accumulating inside cells without having to use any kind of label to specifically tag those lipids. And here we're discovering that immune cells in the bloodstream are actually scavenging up the, the lipids that you eat after, after a fatty meal. And this is very interesting because previously we thought that the immune cells really didn't have anything to do with absorbing fat from the blood until after that fat had already deposited in the blood vessel walls. And so we're kind of changing around our idea for how atherosclerosis takes place. So this is a picture, this is a picture in false color showing basically the same thing with the accumulation of lipids inside cells and tissue. Um, actually, I'm done. <laughs> I got so paranoid about, uh, about finishing this in time. But there are many other techniques that we could talk about that I didn't have, that originally I didn't think I'd have time enough to talk about. This includes conflocal uh, fluorescence lifetime microscopy. Uh, atomic force microscopy, total internal reflection, uh, time-gated Raman, so many, many different techniques that you can play around with once you have a handle on what some of the basic tools are. So, sorry for the, the rush. Hopefully you got something out of that. Questions? Earlier really you were talking about um, it was tangentially related to blood clots, um, yeah. fat protein cells. <coughs> you said it's either stable or it's unstable, and if, if it's unstable, it has the potential to rupture. Right. What exactly did you mean by that? Did you mean that this, the blood vessel will rupture? Yeah, so, so if I, if I can, I can't draw it, but basically if I were to take a, a, a atherosclerotic plaque and just cut it through the middle, you'd see that there was, it would be composed of several layers, okay? And in the middle, basically, would be the fat that had initially deposited on the, in the blood vessel wall. So, what happens is that that fat that gets deposited will be recognized by macrophages that are in tissue, okay? And macrophages are immune cells that are supposed to gobble up foreign objects, okay? So it recognizes the fat as something that doesn't belong there, and it eats it up, and it basically starts an, inflama an inflammation process, okay? So there's local inflammation in that area, and then as a response to that inflammation, the, the body starts to build a wall around it. So this is, it's going to be scar tissue. And so it's laying down collagen fibers around that area of inflammation, okay? And so depending on how quickly this plaque forms, the collagen that gets laid down may be laid down in an organized fashion or it could be deposited in a disorganized fashion, okay? And so this is what ends up being the key to determining whether or not that plaque is stable or not, or not stable. Okay, because if it's laid down in an organized fashion, then that, that wall that's kind of holding, out, holding the insides of that plaque together ends up being very tough, okay, and it's not going to break, and so that becomes a stable plaque, all right, as opposed to something that develops very quickly, and so the wall ends up being very thin and prone to break, okay, and if it breaks, then it ruptures, and now that all that stuff that was inside, that inflammatory, that inflammation that was inside, when it comes out, that causes blood to clot, right overhead, 
Okay, so you got the so in the case of a stroke, you've got not only the the plaque that was originally there, but now you got a blood clot over that. Okay, and it's the blood clot that ends up basically causing 100% occlusion of that blood vessel wall. So it's not that a stable plaque is growing slowly, you know, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96%, but rather it goes from, it's usually an unstable plaque that might be 50% occluded, and you go from 50 to 100 in a moment as soon as, as, soon as that plaque ruptures. So does that answer the question? Kind of, still trying to picture this. So if, it's, if something deposits there, the macrophage will pry and and eat it up, right? Are they actually part of the wall, the stuff, the blood vessel wall? Yeah, yeah, so, so it ends up, well, so when you say part of the wall, what part? Uh, so what's like, being part I'm of the wall? I'm picturing it just kind of as a tube, and like, somewhere in the wall there's this macrophage. Yeah, yeah. And what it is. Yeah, right. So very active. Right, so the wall has many layers. You've got endothelium, you've got, um, you've got basement membrane, you've got a layer where the blood vessels are, you've got some muscle underneath that. And so the foam, the, um, the fat deposits in the top layer. Okay, but then, the, and so some of it will diffuse deeper down into the vessel wall, but then the macrophages that are normally in the circulation will stop at the point where it sees that some, some fat has deposited, and it basically burrows itself in there and starts eating up the macrophages. So the macrophages basically go from being in the circulation to depositing itself in the tissue of that blood vessel wall. Okay, and then a plaque starts to form, so it's almost like a mosquito bite or something like that. It starts to swell up. Okay, and then the core are all those macrophages that ate up the fat. Okay, but then around that is going to be now some connective tissue and fiber, the collagen fibers start depositing in there. And so now the architecture around there has changed. So it's not this nice architecture where you got these many layers of the blood vessel wall. Now you've got this, this, like, um, this local area of inflammation that's got its own kind of architecture. Okay, and that architecture may be one that reflects a stable plaque or an unstable plaque. Right. And so what used to be kind of embedded in the vessel wall has now kind of become its own entity, and it's kind of growing into, into the blood vessel wall. And so the instability <coughs> So the instability is when that, that object itself, okay, it's, you kind of can think of it like a pearl. If that pearl should rupture, right, then that becomes a, an opportunity now for the blood to recognize that side of injury, all right, and then suddenly form a blood clot over, overhead. So does that help? Okay. Uh, I, don't, I think there's ways. You guys remember how I talked about you can turn the fiber optic into a blood vessel? And you talked about it in the sense of trying to remove the clot or pull it out with the long dollar opens. But you can also, there's also a tool that's being developed now that you can go inside the vessel. And as you kind of put the, the fiber optic in, and you kind of pull it out in a steady way. And as you're pulling it out, it's taking images of the inside and it's doing it in such a way that it can tell all the different types of buildups inside your vessel, and you can tell the difference between these vulnerable plants and more solid plants. So it gives you a sense of how vulnerable are you actually have on these things that are So yeah, here this it's not a very it's not a very high resolution picture, but you can sort of see this would be a normal blood vessel wall, and then over time you might have the buildup of fatty plaque. And so if you were to look at the if you were to look closely at this, if I were to take a plaque and kind of cut it, get a cross section, you'd see that there were many structures within it. So you might have the fat in the middle, but then outside <laughs> that plaque is just skin, right? And that skin, the integrity of that skin is what determines whether that plaque is going to be, going to be stable or not. And if that skin breaks, now suddenly you're, you're allowing the blood to see that inflammatory core inside that plaque, okay? And by allowing the blood to see that, now the blood suddenly decides, well, I need to clot over this thing because this thing, I, I can't let this stuff get out into the bloodstream, right? And so by forming that clot, it inadvertently causes blockage of that whole vessel. Right? You ever make a sand castle top? <coughs> Think of like if you got wet sand and you lay down the base of the wet sand, but you didn't get enough. Now think about like you put a layer of dry sand on top and you put another layer of wet sand on top. You've got a surface in there that things can slide off at a different part. So if the collagen builds up all nicely, you get this nice tough surface that you made the whole towel out of wet sand. But otherwise, if you've got the, you build it in layers, and if maybe one of the layers isn't so smooth with the dry sand, you kind of show up. Okay. I confuse you more than I helped you. <laughs> does it ever go away, or does it just 
say like that for a little Mac is actually uh, there's there's some thinking that if you catch it early on by taking drugs like Lipitor, uh, these are these are drugs that'll basically lower your cholesterol and help kind of the body reabsorb fat from the bloodstream. So if you if you reduce the fat in the bloodstream, then basically you cause diffusion in the reverse direction, so that the fat will just leave the blood vessel walls and go back into the bloodstream because there's actually a lower concentration of, of fat in the bloodstream. And so that might be a way to reverse the effects. But once you've gotten inflammation like this to occur and you're already laying down collagen, then it becomes much tougher to, to try and reverse the effects simply by just reabsorbing so the fat. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Pretty much in, in Western society, you can't avoid it. It's in your diet. You know, even if you try to eat healthy, you know, just these things. I mean, this might cause you to go convert to vegetarianism, uh, but but for the most part, if you eat meat, then this is this is uh, pretty much unavoidable. But then physical activity also. So it depends on how fast you can use it up. There are people with very high metabolic rates, and so you actually will will burn up, you know, fats, and you'll use up energy so much that really the body doesn't have time to accumulate fat. Okay, it's only when your body is saturated that it's like, look, I'm using all the fat that I need, so any more that you eat, I don't know what to do with, and so it gets deposited in the blood vessel wall. Sorry, there was another question? Yeah. I was going to ask Chris on uh, how small the microfiber has is to get into the blood vessel yeah, so here these are you can see these are so these are these are pictures of the actual fibers yeah. that are being used, and so this is a penny, right? And so these are very, very small. <coughs> right? Because right. Because you're, you're, not, you're not trying to go through the carotid artery, for example. Carotid may be, I don't know, five millimeters, all right? All right, that's how, big, that's, how, that's how big the carotid artery is, which is pretty big. But you're talking about your coronary arteries, and so these are the vessels. This is a heart, right? And so you have these, ves these arteries that are on the outside of the heart, supplying blood to the heart muscle itself, okay? And those are the ones that lead you to have a heart attack. So if you were to have a blood clot form within the coronary artery, now suddenly, basically, the heart cramps up because it's a, it's a muscle just like any other muscle. So when it doesn't get oxygen, suddenly your heart muscle cramps up, and that cramping, you feel, that's angina, right? And so then that's the beginnings of a heart attack, right? And those, those vessels are like on the order of maybe one, two millimeters sometimes. So very small. So these fibers need to be small enough to get inside there. And, yeah, then there's some concerns because if the plaque is 90% occluded, now you've got maybe, I don't know, 800 microns to, to clear. And so you're, you don't want to, like, scrape over that plaque because you're trying to determine whether it's, it's stable or not. And you go over it, you drag over it with a, over, with a blunt fiber optic, and now it's like, oops, you ruptured the plaque just by trying to look at it. So that wouldn't be good. Sorry. Yeah. I actually have a question about that. Do you have two buildings? Do you want to get really cool without having an earthquake? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. If there was an earthquake, I would probably jump underneath it. Well, so the question is whether you want to be out in the open or whether you want to have two stories, a two story building over your head. So, yeah, I mean, if that building collapses, then I want to be in the underground garage. But I guess my first choice would be to just get out of the damn building in the first place. <laughs> what I wanted to do really was to install two seismometers. So one on the outside of Second and Stockton, just to show how much less ground vibration there is inside the lab as opposed to outside. Also to make sure that we have our money's worth in terms of, uh, in yeah, terms of the that building. In the, in the cafeteria type area, yeah. you can feel when a truck goes by. Yeah. So it's not the whole building that's isolated. It's mostly the lab area. Yeah. And we have also this thing called an atomic force microscope that really, it's like a record player that has a needle that's going over a very smooth surface, and it basically bumps every time it hits a DNA molecule, right? And so you can imagine with that kind of instrumentation, you really, really don't want to have any kind of vibrations going on at the time. So. All right. So, all right, you guys are really, um, I, I'll be around Wednesday, and if, uh, if you guys have any questions, please feel free, feel free to look for me. My office has a sign called the War Room outside, so definitely stop by and say hi. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. So please don't forget that Wednesday we'll be expecting your uh, revised lab report. And I still don't have all the information for all of you about your hair thickness. So about, I think it's five of you haven't sent it to me. Okay. That email that I said, please send me this information. Where do you get that from here?
I have almost everyone in the group, but I still have to get a couple of so. What are we, are we allowed to just include that data, the whole class of data, or are we doing something else? No. Okay. I'm going to do something else. Okay. Because okay. I haven't gotten it all, I can't make you include it. It would be okay. unfair. Okay. okay. But please send me uh, the rest of you. Okay.